So we'd like to present today uh, two new tools that we've released, the Responsible AI Mitigations Library and the Responsible AI Tracker. Uh, we'll walk through them today and give you guys a demo. So before we jump in, we want to thank our entire V team that's worked on this project. It's been a truly collaborative uh, process across a couple of different teams from Microsoft Research to the Ether Central team, which is a Microsoft advisory body that looks at ethics and effects in engineering and research, and Azure ML, the responsible AI tooling team. So today what we'll go over is the goals and overview for the tools that I mentioned. We'll talk a little bit about what they do and how it works, and then we'll get into a demo and talk a little bit about what we're working on next and do some Q&A. So the tools that we're going to talk about today are all a part of the Responsible AI Toolbox, which is an open source framework for accelerating and operationalizing responsible AI principles using a set of interoperable tools, libraries, and some customizable dashboards. Um, Kind of looking at this, recent releases that we've had, uh, last year we released the Responsible AI Dashboard, which is a single pane of glass that allows you to bring together various tools that allow you to do error analysis, fairness assessments, interpretability, data exploration, and counterfactual analysis. All of these tools are available in open source and in Azure ML. The two new tools that we're gonna talk about today are the Responsible AI Mitigations Library and the Tracker. The Mitigations Library is a Python library that implements and helps people explore mitigations for responsible AI on tabular data specifically. The second piece is the Responsible AI Tracker, which is a Jupyter Lab extension that helps in tracking, managing, um, and comparing responsible AI mitigations and notebooks um, and the experiments that you would do for training on tabular data. So before we get into the specifics of these tools, um, you'll notice a couple of themes for the overall Responsible AI toolbox. One is targeted model debugging and improvement, which really involves digging a little bit deeper when thinking about how to improve model performance and really optimizing models while making sure that they are responsible and not causing any harms to specific groups. The second theme is interplay between code, data, models, and visualizations. We like to see how we can bring all of these different pieces together to make sure that we are leveraging insights from all of the sides when optimizing our models. So what is targeted debugging for machine learning? Um, we generally like to think about this in a series of four steps that kind of go in a life cycle as you go through the process. Um, the first is identification. The identification stage highlights where errors are concentrated in an ML model. Um, in other words, it characterizes failure modes and describes them for data scientists, where the model is performing well and where it might be underperforming as well. Um, with some of the tools that we've put together in the Responsible AI dashboard, you can kind of take a deeper look at which data groups might be uh, causing lower performance and go and address those specifically. So if we take a little bit closer look here, um, as an example, if you have a model that you've trained uh, and you're seeing it has a 73.8% accuracy rate at the top level, that seems pretty good perhaps, but if you take a little bit deeper look and think about which groups are performing better than others, you might find that there are pockets within your data. Let's say for a housing price prediction problem, you might have houses that are older than a certain number of years where your model isn't performing as well. You can see there might be some small portions of the data, what we call cohorts or different data groups, where the model is going to have a lower performance due to certain um, characteristics of that data perhaps. And so this is an opportunity to kind of find those pockets of lower performance and then make improvements to your model to specifically target those cohorts. The next two steps in the targeted debugging lifecycle are diagnosis and mitigation. 
Uh, this is where some of the new tools that we've built come in with the Responsible AI Mitigations Library. The diagnosis process really involves getting into the data and seeing what might be causing some of the um, lower performing cohorts that we talked about within the training data, within the model training process. The second piece of that is the mitigation step where we want to actually figure out what sort of changes we need to make in the overall pipeline to fix those problems. These are both things that the Responsible AI Mitigations Library, which we'll talk about more, can help out with. And just to contrast this against how, in many cases, the model improvement lifecycle works, is that often when you're looking at just the top level error of a model, you might say, okay, you know what, let me throw more data at this problem, let me throw more compute at it until the model performance goes and improves a little bit. This sort of blanket approach um, can lead to uh, results, but we think that there are a lot more targeted improvements to be made when you look a little bit deeper at things like cohorts and um, looking at the performance on that level. Uh, in fact, sometimes adding more data in general without too much thought into what that data looks like and how it breaks down across cohorts can even hurt particular cohorts' performance because of data noise or unpredicted shifts in the balance of data. So the last step in this targeted debugging lifecycle is to kind of compare and validate some of the mitigations that you may have made to your model. Um, the tool that we have put together to help with this process is a responsible AI tracker, which kind of helps you to bring together some of the notebooks that you're using to train models, the data that you're using to train and test those models, as well as the models themselves, plus visualizations that can help you understand how those models are performing in comparison to one another. So before we jump into the exact uh, specifics of the tools that we've built, I'd like you to keep in mind again that we're kind of trying to bring together all these different pieces from the code, data, models, and visualizations to make sure that we can kind of leverage all of them in the model improvement lifecycle. Um, a lot of tools out there today perhaps leverage one or several of them, but not all of them together. And so we're trying to do what we can to kind of bring it all together. So first, we'll do a little overview of the Responsible AI Tracker. The Responsible AI Tracker is a Jupyter Lab extension. Jupyter Lab, as most of you are probably familiar with, is the next generation of Jupyter Notebooks, and it enables practitioners to work on more than one notebook at the same time. Jupyter Lab has an interesting aspect as well, that it not only lets you interact with notebooks and your models, but it can accommodate visualizations and interactive components instead of just code. So you'll see this a little bit later in the demo, but based on our investigations, when it comes to model comparison, many data scientists are still using very generalized tools to compare their models or building very customized, um, somewhat manual workflows using PowerPoint, Excel worksheets in some cases, to uh, bring together different model performance metrics and do some disaggregated analysis. More so, disaggregated analysis has not been thus far supported within any of the tools that have been available today. And so that's something else that we're bringing together. So we will show you kind of how the Responsible AI Tracker works in the demo, but as a quick overview, you can see here within Jupyter Lab, the Responsible AI Tracker allows you to put together in the left panel some of the notebooks that you might be working with. You might have iterations uh, of the same model that you're training in slightly different ways, making adjustments to the data processing pipeline, to the training process, and we allow you to keep track of those notebooks as well as register the models associated with each of those different training processes. Uh, then, as you see in the center, you'll, we get this model comparison view, which allows you to select which uh, metrics you want to look at, as well as designate specific cohorts. Let's say within a population, you want to look at how the model is performing on married people versus not married people, and make sure there aren't any glaring errors in specific cohorts that you might be interested in. 
this is especially important um, when you're thinking about responsible AI because there might be certain uh, demographics or subgroups within your data that if they are underperforming can lead to uh, unfairness in when those uh, when those models are put into production and so this is kind of allowing you to dig a little bit deeper and take a look at how those performance metrics are looking um, beyond just the top level metrics So let's talk about the Responsible AI Mitigations Library. This is a Python library, as I mentioned, that kind of fits into the process of diagnosing where errors might be happening and then making targeted fixes to address those errors. So what we do in this library is bring together a rich set of different mitigations focused on data quality, that might help with improving the performance of an ML model. A lot of these are available in different um, popular libraries such as sklearn, but we're kind of bringing them together in one place and uh, providing some additional functionality on top that we think will help people kind of take, uh, find all of the things that they might need in one place. Beyond that, we have created a simple interface for adding mitigation steps using the fit and transform convention. And all of these function calls can be extended as well to target specific cohorts. We were talking about how some of these cohorts might be performing worse than others uh, in the model. And so you can actually create different pipelines for specific cohorts to target the errors that might be occurring in each one. Lastly, uh, you can also train different models for different cohorts if that's something that seems like it would help. So we'll talk about a little bit the components in this library. The first is data processing. We have a number of um, mitigation techniques that can change certain aspects of the data set, such as encoders for categorical data, imputers for missing data, feature categorization, um, and feature selection tools. These are all often uh, kind of wrapped from existing libraries, but we've, like I said, brought them together to kind of bring in the cohort element as well. And so the cohort module that we have here has two pieces. One is a cohort manager. Um, it provides classes for creating and managing cohorts, designating wins that might be of interest to you in your model training process. Uh, with an easy and intuitive interface. The model module also provides techniques for learning different decoupled estimators or decoupled classifiers for different cohorts to combine weaker cohorts in a way that optimizes fairness for the group. The last piece here is the data balance analysis module, which provides metrics for diagnosing errors that originate from things like data imbalance on class labels or feature values. So take a little deeper look at some of the pieces that are kind of net new here. The cohort manager, like I said, allows you to create and filter cohorts within your training data and testing data. And so the what you're able to do here is specify that there might be uh, certain values in um, certain columns that you want to say, okay, I want to look at just people who are married or for housing income, housing prediction price you want to look at houses that are older than a certain number of years old. On top of that, once you've defined a cohort, you can uh, apply different data processing pipelines to each of these cohorts that might help mitigate some of the issues that are specific to those groups. Lastly, you can go and train different estimators for each cohort using PREDICT and PREDICT PROVE interfaces. Basa will show you a little bit about that in the demo. The second new piece here is the decoupled classifier. This is an implementation based on a paper linked here by Cynthia Dwork, Nicole Lemorlika, Adam Nikolai, and Max Leiserson. And this allows you to learn different estimators for cohorts of interest. Beyond what the cohort manager already does, this also allows for certain post-training steps that combine different classifiers to optimize a joint loss function.
just to give you a little bit more of a concrete idea of what this might look like, here is a example workflow that might that you might use with the mitigation library. So if you look up at the top, we have some data that we're starting with um, where we want to make a prediction and we go and train the model the way that we think might work best and we get some level of performance. Maybe it's not great. We can then implement different mitigation pipelines to try out things that might improve that model performance. Some of those might involve just making changes on the entire data set. For, perhaps we're going to do some data scaling and impute some missing values, and that will improve performance to some extent. You can then say, hey, maybe my data isn't looking very balanced, and uh, go and rebalance that data and see how that works as well. Where things get a little bit more interesting is when you take a step deeper into the cohort manager and say, hey, you know what? For some groups of this data, the data is pretty balanced. Other groups, certain cohorts, we need to do some rebalancing that is specific to those cohorts. And then you can specify, you'll see at the bottom here, for cohort zero, perhaps the data is balanced enough and you just do the scale and impute steps in your pipeline and, and uh, train an estimator. But for cohort one, we see that it's a lot more imbalanced. And so we apply a rebalance step only to that cohort before doing the, the scale and impute steps. And that ends up leading to an even better model than if we had kind of done the rebalance on the whole. And so um, this is where the library allows you to kind of make that very targeted improvement to your model to optimize performance. Now we'll go over to BESA for a demo of some of these tools and how they fit together with uh, some of the existing tools on the market. Thank you, Rahe. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Or, uh, or? I think you want to go to the other screen. Uh, let me see. What about yeah. now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thanks, Riley, for the for the great overview. Uh, I think this gives like um, a good basis for us to talk about um, how can we use these tools in practice. So uh, what we're going to do here is that uh, we're going to illustrate the functionality of um, the three tools that were discussed in the overview, Responsible AI Dashboard, Responsible AI Mitigations Library, and Responsible AI Tracker through a case study. And the case study here is going uh, to be based on an open source data set, uh, which many of you may have worked with in the past. That is the um, adult census income prediction data set. Um, in this data, there is um, several features about age, gender, education, capital gain, and, and other types of information that um, will be used to predict whether a person uh, earns more or less than 50K from the census data. Um, and uh, what I'm sharing here in the screen is just the initial view from Responsible AI Tracker, the extension on uh, Jupyter Lab. So this would be the usual view on uh, Jupyter Lab, and you can find uh, after installation you can find the extension here. And what this does is that it sort of enriches the platform, uh, the plugin, by being able to access the different uh, notebooks on the side, provide visualizations that we are going to see later in model comparison. But at the same time, uh, it also enables you to sort of map different models to different notebooks. So at a very high level here, if you imagine uh, all these notebooks to be different mitigation steps, you can map uh, a particular model that was created through that notebook um to uh to to the model and here i have pre-registered all the models ahead of time so that we can uh, focus on the functionality but basically this is how you do it um after training different models 
So let's see what happens here. This is the baseline uh, notebook that is going to produce for us the, um, the baseline model. What we are basically doing here is just implementing some very simple mitigation steps on uh, feature imputation and one hot encoding, which are uh, sort of like very well known in this community. And then um, after that, what we're doing is uh, spinning off the Responsible AI dashboard for understanding how these errors are distributed in the test data set. And that is uh, for us to understand um, what steps should we be taking next so that uh, we take an informed decision about how to improve the model. Um, this is the dashboard with all its components. Uh, there are several components of the dashboard and uh, we have given um, seminars on um, um, on a detailed manner about each of the components in the past with this community. So feel free to take a look at them as well um, after this webinar. But what we are going to use mostly in this case is um, error analysis and, um, and data analysis. So here this visualization shows us how the errors are distributed. And uh, one of the main things that comes up here is the fact that there is a high discrepancy in error between people who are um, married, so this is going to be the uh, individuals who are married, the error rate for this cohort is 39%, while the base error rate is uh, 21%. So we're talking here about a two times increase in error for this cohort, um, which sort of gives us an idea about you know, where, where to focus in, in terms of debugging. And then we can also see that for um, the unmarried individuals, the error rate is only 6%. Um, let's do some more investigation though. Let's see uh, what happens with the data. And in order to do that type of investigation, we can go to the, um, to the data analysis, which is yet another component in the dashboard. And we can see that for the overall data, this is how the data balance across classes looks like. So we can see that there is some sort of, uh, you know, skew towards um, individuals earning less than 50K. And that is perhaps uh, because that is the natural um, distribution um, historically. And we can also uh, see that for not married um, individuals, the skew is, um, pretty similar to the overall data, but when we switch to the married cohort, things look more balanced. And of course, there may be you know, uh, different reasons about this. It's, uh, it may be based on like double income, but end of the day, what we are seeing here from a learning perspective is that the prior in the overall data is very different from the prior in this particular cohort, which is something that perhaps we may, uh, we may want to address in different ways. So taking this information into account, then we go back to, um, to Tracker and see what we can implement to balance the data. The first thing that we are going to try out um, is something that perhaps many of you have done uh, in terms of data balancing. Um, so basically we are going to use a data balancing um, technique that is going to uh, rebalance the data in overall without um, having any targeted consideration. So what we are doing here is that we are taking the whole data and I'm going to just like slightly zoom in here so that we can all see. Uh, we have defined the cohorts here just for the methods of the definition, but for the data, we are uh, rebalancing the whole data um, based on uh, based on just the uh, uh, responsible AI mitigations library without any cohorts. And uh, we can go back to model comparison to see whether um, there, is, there are any changes here that have been introduced in uh, the balanced data. So uh, just a quick overview here on the model comparison table. Basically, this allows you to look at different models, select different models from uh, the view, select different metrics, and also uh, select different cohorts. Um, for now, we are just going to compare the data balancing with the original baseline. And we can see that in overall, uh, there is an improvement. There is an almost 4% uh, improvement. Um, but 
there is still a discrepancy in terms of accuracy between the married and the not married cohorts. And uh, this is basically the first thing that we saw through uh, error analysis that this is a discrepancy that persists in the data for because of data balancing issues. So it seems like we haven't been completely able to, uh, to figure out how to improve performance for the merit cohort. And actually, if we go back and look at the data, like how, how it appears after the, the rebalancing, um, we can see that the prior on uh, the merit cohort has completely shifted in that um, it has gone in the opposite uh, direction. And because of the way how these techniques work, when they do not have any targeted information about cohorts, um, most of the rebalancing here in the full data frame has happened by sampling just more data from the merit cohort, which end of the day, it, it may not benefit this cohort as much as uh, what we expected. So next we're going to do something different. We are going to separate this rebalancing through the merit cohort and the not merit cohort. Um, and uh, we are going to do this separately so that whatever is sampled from the data stays and it is isolated within the cohort. In that if we just add like more positive samples from the merit cohort, we know that it, it will follow that distribution. And um, let's see how to actually implement this by using the, um, the Responsible AI Mitigations Library. This is really simple, and it's one of the things that uh, basically provides the programmatic flexibility from the library. Um, this is how we'll do it um, in code. We'll define the two cohorts. The first one is the merit cohort in, in the language of the data set, this would mean that the relationship is either wife or husband. And then uh, C2 is, in this case, the rest of the data and uh, what we're calling the not married cohort um, in this case. And then we define two pipelines. The one pipeline that does the rebalancing for cohort one and one that does it for cohort two. And we will apply these pipelines through the cohort manager class this is the set of pipelines and this is the set of cohorts. And that is it. So basically what the cohort manager is going to do behind the scenes is that it is going to split the data and it is going to save time uh, so that the data scientist doesn't have to do this themselves. Um, it is going to rebalance the data separately and in an isolated fashion by using the two different pipelines that do not interfere with, with each other. And then after the rebalancing, it is going to re-merge the data back and then uh, after calling fit resample. And then after that, we can do whatever we want with that data. And basically in this case, we are um, just training a new model with the merge data. But all, so basically like these lines of code do everything for you and uh, you don't have to think about how to merge split and, and all that. Um, let's see though how the data looks like after we apply this particular mitigation. We can see that everything is particular is um, is perfectly balanced, uh, including the full data frame. And um, what happens here though is that if we compare the distribution of the not married cohort before and after the mitigation, we can see that the not married cohort before was very similar, like, you know, it had that natural distribution on, of having the skew on the negative label, and now it is, um, it is balanced. So let's see what is the impact of that with respect to model comparison. And I'm going to remove the previous uh, mitigation that we saw earlier, and um, I'm going to add this one. So as we can see, um, the new model is sort of comparable in a way with, um, with the old model, if we just look at the overall score. But if we chop down, if we perform disaggregated model comparison, we can see that even though things improved for the merit cohort, which is like what we had in mind on, on the first place, um, there is a drop of almost 10% in accuracy for the not merit cohort. And uh, based on what we saw earlier, the main reason for this is because we completely changed the original prior on um, this particular part of the data. 
and this is an indicator for us that, well, you know, like maybe things are good if we rebalance for the merit cohort, but perhaps we shouldn't be doing this for uh, for the not merit one. And this is where that targeted uh, mitigation idea comes in, in that as a programmer, as a data scientist, one should have the flexibility to sort of tailor all these things according to the things that uh, you see in um, the data or model analysis. Um, very often we also refer to these issues when performance drops suddenly during an update, even though the model may stay equally accurate, as backward incompatibility issues, meaning that during the update, we are introducing errors that were not present in the previous versions of the model. And this happens for many, many different reasons. It can happen because of the data shift, which is basically what we did now. We introduced the data sh uh, shift synthetically. It can happen because of architectural changes in the model um, or just because of like usual data quality issues that may happen in the real world. Um, so now let's see uh, whether there is something more that we can do here. So uh, basically to, to try to leave the distribution on the not merit cohort untouched and uh, apply the mitigation only on the merit cohort. And we're calling this targeted uh, balancing. So what we will do in this case is, is again, very simple and similar to what we saw earlier. Um, we would define two pipelines, but the second pipeline will leave it empty because we don't want to change the distribution on the not married cohort. And the rest of the code is exactly the same as what we saw earlier. Um, what happens if we do that? We see that the married cohort is, um, is perfectly balanced. The not married cohort keeps the distribution as it was before. And the full data frame is slightly more balanced than what it was at the beginning. Although not perfectly so, but that may um, may just be like uh, how how it should be in in terms of um, of being able to handle all the different uh, cohorts. Then let's go back to the model comparison table, and uh, just for the sake of clarity, I'll remove this one as well, and I will add the balancing all data as we saw earlier, and we can see that indeed. It is possible to improve the accuracy on the merit cohort by 12% by not sacrificing um, the performance in the rest of the data. In that still here, we're able to keep a pretty good performance. And uh, we're also closing somewhat the gap between uh, the two cohorts. And of course, like there, there may be more that one can do to customize steps on this particular one. But this is just like one of those examples that, that illustrates um, what targeted mitigation can value. Um, so finally, I'll also uh, show how to perhaps take a different approach on this, in that since we saw that the, um, the prior is so important, at least for this particular model, um, one may think, well, what would happen if I do not perform any data mitigation, but if I'd like the model to handle this type of complexity on the, um, on the balance? And one way of how one can do that would be to build separate models for each of the cohorts. And again, uh, this will not uh, always be possible, but it is something that you know can can be an option if you have enough compute or enough resources to to afford more than one model in um, in in in, the, in this case. So uh, basically, what we are doing here is that for um, training separate models, we are still going to use the um, uh, the cohort manager, but we are going to, um, to to give it as an input the not only the pipeline but also uh, the model to be able to train it separately. And um, let's take a look of what happens uh, in this case. Uh, I'm perhaps going to leave uh, only the ones that are more competitive in uh, this case, the targeted um, data balancing and uh, the separate model. And we can see that um, in overall, both these two models achieve very similar performance. So why is that? That in this case, what we are doing is that we are 
giving away or delegating the complexity of dealing with different data balances to the model itself. And because these models are specialized on these particular two cohorts, they will be able to handle that, um, that data imbalance complexity. And we can see that uh, we are able to handle merit and not merit cohorts um, pretty reasonably, considering of how the situation was at the beginning. Now, that is something that will not work in, in all cases. Um, specialized models for, uh, for different cohorts can handle things like data balancing or perhaps uh, feature engineering if there is some sort of non-linearity in, um, in the features that needs to be handled. But they may not be able to deal with things like errors in the data or noise in the data. And um, in this particular case, a combination of both data mitigations and, um, and model mitigations can, can be a good approach. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to conclude the demo and, um, and open it up for questions and, and for Ahi to, uh, to wrap up the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Besa. Let's go back to here. So um, before we go into the questions, uh, we have a couple of links here to all of the GitHub pages for the tools that we talked about today, as well as the Responsible AI Toolbox. Uh, we also have links to some blogs that we recently released that talk about these tools as well, as well as the process to building them. Um, and looking ahead, we are going to continue developing all of these tools. Uh, some of the things that we're looking at in terms of developing next are kind of expanding the responsible AI dashboard to support more use cases with vision and language instead of just tabular data. And then we also plan to continue developing the responsible AI tracker and mitigations libraries. These are first versions. And so we're looking for feedback from the open source community to see how we can continue to build on and improve these tools. So with that, we will jump into questions. 